Hi everyone, welcome to the October 1st edition of the Time Form US Forecast. I'm David Aragon, and I'll be joined in just a second by my usual co-host Craig Mulkowski. And with it being October, that means that we have Breeders' Cup preps coming at us fast and furious, and that's certainly the case on Saturday at Santa Anita, where they will run a number of graded stakes races, most of them as part of the Late Pick 5 sequence, and that's what we're going to talk about on this podcast, that Late Pick 5 on Saturday at Santa Anita, races 7 through 11. Uh, race 7's a non-stakes event, a pretty interesting one at that, but races 8 through 11 are all graded stakes events, the feature being the grade 1 Awesome again, which features Kentucky Derby first place finisher Medina Spirit facing off against Tripoli, who just won the Pacific Classic. We'll get to that in a little bit, but Craig, this looks like a pretty interesting sequence, definitely one where you can spread in the first few legs, and particularly this first leg, the non-stakes race. Yes, as, as you talked about offline, uh, you could almost spend as much time on this race as the other four combined, in part due to field size, but also because it's a, a pretty complex race, in my opinion. There's a lot going on. So looking forward to diving into these races. I, I think there's some some suspect favorites, uh, or maybe I should say vulnerable favorites later on in the sequence. So I think it's going to be a fun bet and one I look forward to actually putting in a ticket. And as we've been doing over the last several weeks, we're going to talk about these races from the analytical standpoint, what our picks are. And then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about ticket structure, how we might put together these bets uh, and which races we really want to lean on, which horses we want to lean on, which races that we're going to de-emphasize a little bit, try to maybe catch a price. Uh, so we'll talk about all of that at the end. But let's get into the handicapping right now with that first leg of the sequence. Race seven, optional claiming 50,000, nominators of one other than is the allowance condition going a mile on the turf and we've got a full field of 12 runners with also a couple of AEs that might make an impact on this race if they get in, particularly the number 13 first Premio. Uh, we'll see if there's a scratch because he would need just one of those to get into this race. Uh, but really hard to know where the public's going to land. The slight favorite on the morning line is the number 10 secret club. And I've got to say, if he is the favorite, that's one that I want to play against. Yeah, it's really hard to say. I, I'm not sure if he is going to be the favorite. I can see why he is on the morning line, and, and it has everything to do with Peter Miller, who in the Timeform US ratings is a 98 first time off the claim. Uh, he is being claimed by uh, from Sean McCarthy, though, a trainer I have a lot of respect for. So I'm not sure there's a ton of upside in here. So for me, he's a horse I'll use, but I, I wouldn't consider him an A-type horse. Yeah, with those trainer stats, I like to drill down a bit further in Formulator, and when I look up Peter Miller's stats first off the claim, specifically in turf routes... He's just two for 40 over the past five years with a 5% win rate of 41 cent ROI. So the bulk of those stats that are positive for Peter Miller have been uh, compiled in dirt races, a little bit in turf sprints, but he really has not had a whole lot of success claiming turf routers at all. Uh, so if this horse is going to get bet on the assumption that he's going to improve in the Peter Miller barn, I'm a little bit skeptical of that. And I don't really see him as necessarily being good enough if he doesn't improve. So I would just leave him out completely. He's not for me at all in this leg. And I want to go in some different directions. You've got a few horses coming out of some common races. I do want to talk about the horses that finished behind Evening Sun twice at Del Mar, both on July 24th and August 21st. I think One Fast Bro is a horse that you have to have an opinion about in this race because he is the one watching that last race on August 21st that really probably should have won. He was caught in behind horses at the top of the stretch, had a lot of traffic to deal with. His rider just could never really extricate him until until it was too late and he did finish well once he finally got into the clear in the last eighth in my view one fast bro is probably the horse to beat yeah, he is definitely one of my A horses in this field, particularly for what you talked about. And it's one of those where, you know, you can read the trouble lines in the chart, but you never really know. I like to watch them for, for myself, as I know you do. And part of what will make me watch a race is when I see a dip in a speed figure and a seemingly good effort. And he went from a 109, which would be really strong in this field, to a 103. So I watched it fully expecting to find some real trouble. And there was. There's no doubt about it. He was was kind of held up. He lost his momentum before regaining and coming on again late. So he's a horse I definitely think you have to use in this sequence. 
I want to talk a little bit about the pace of this race because you've got the number two, U.S. Danger, who is just one of these runoff speed types. He looks completely unrateable. His riders just kind of have to drop their hands and basically hope and pray that he gets the distance. There's not really much you can do to slow him down in the early going of his races, but he's not the only speed horse in this race. And I would be a little bit concerned if I was on a horse that typically gets a stalking trip or wants to be on the lead, potentially like the number seven, Subconscious, who's been on the lead in some prior starts or another horse with speed towards the outside, like Dominant Soul, they could really be taken out of their best game by the number two, who's just going to run off. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Constitution Affair is another one, the six horse who's done his best running on the front end. And I think if you're going to use a speed horse in here, it almost has to be U.S. Danger because it's hard to see him not totally taking all of the other speed horses and even the ones that like to lay close and try to pound slate uh, just totally out of their games. Uh, it's something I use as a pace handicapper often where I think that, that a speed horse is just too fast for the other speed horses. Uh, I remember I used this in the Jackie's Warrior race last week where only one horse in there had ever shown any ability whatsoever to come from off the pace. And he wound up running second in the race. The other speeds were, were terrible at a nice price. And, and that's kind of what I'm going to do here. So one of the other horses I'm going to focus on since we're going away is a horse who likes to come from off the pace. And that's Lincoln Hawk, the one horse. Uh, some of the people that follow me on Twitter will, will know that I'm a big over the top fan, the greatest armor wrestling movie ever made and that was the main character's name but it really has nothing to do with that I, I think he's a horse who his speed figures show he can be competitive in here he seems to be getting better every time he draws a much better post than he had last time and, and he had some trouble at the start of that last race so he's looking he's one that I look to uh, can run right around that 110 speed figure that it's going to be necessary to win this race yeah, I agree. I think Lincoln Hawk is a major player in this race. I actually thought he was somewhat interesting in the Del Mar Derby last time. He didn't run badly at 28 to 1, but like you said, a little bit of trouble at the start, was far back early, but that's kind of his MO. He's not a horse that gets out of the gate that quickly. He typically finds himself really far back, but that could be an asset in this race because you probably do want to be making the last move given how quick the pace is likely to be. So breaking from the rail, I think Lincoln Hawk could work out the right trip for him, and he just makes a lot of sense to me. A couple other horses that I do want to mention because while this is a spread race in the sequence, I do think you kind of have to narrow it down a little bit to make your ticket affordable because it's not like you can just single the rest of the way through. You do want to have some horses that you're going to lean on in this race, even if they are decent prices. So a couple of the horses that I want to focus on would be the number four, Memo Daddy, who's going to be the biggest price of the ones that I want to emphasize in this race. He's 12 to one on the morning line. Uh, he's got coming out of the same last two race, or I should say the same last race as one fast bro. And he did get a better trip that day. He was kind of in traffic around the far turn, but he got into the clear sooner than one fast bro did and just wasn't as good as that horse. But prior to that too, back Memo Daddy had a real trip as he was trying to come through on the inside, got bumped by the eventual winner who was disqualified for bumping this horse and another one and just got completely stymied in traffic and steadied out. And he would have been in the money that day, but just had no chance given the traffic that he encountered in the last furlong. So I do think Memo Daddy's in better form than it appears. And he's another one that I think is going to get the kind of off the pace trip that he really wants to get. Uh, so he's one that I definitely want to use. And another horse that I would throw into the mix, even though his running style could work against him, is the number nine, Burnin Turf. He's relatively lightly raced for this field, coming off a layoff, but I thought he showed some ability earlier in the year. I liked his win over one fast boy at Santa Anita back in March. It, he just seemed like he was the best horse that day. Uh, one fast bro had every chance to get him, and Burn and Turf just held him off. Uh, Dan Blacker doesn't have the greatest stats coming off layoffs, but I like the way this horse has been working, and he's shown the ability to come from just off the pace in the past, so I'm hoping he can be a bit more adaptable, and I just think he's one of the most talented horses in this race, so I don't want to leave him out. Yeah, and one thing, like you mentioning Memo Daddy, I mean, I think clearly one fast bro is probably a better horse. But the reason I want to spread in this race is, is when you have a race that's going to be strung out like this, tactics are going to come into it. There's going to be some speed horses backing up and just dropping anchor, I'm sure. It's hard to say exactly which ones. But there's the very real, real possibility of some tough trips in here. So I don't want to think you want to lean too heavily on any one or two horses. So I do like the spread idea in here. And I do just briefly want to touch upon the number 13, First Premio, that also eligible entrant that I mentioned at the start. Uh, he has form that would clearly beat this field, but 
Feels like as a seven-year-old, maybe he's on the downswing. He was going off form for Mark Cassie before he changed Barnes a few times. And Jeff Mullins is another one of these trainers that does well off the claim. Not necessarily, though, with turf routers or with turf horses in general. He's had just one winner first off the claim on the turf over the past five years. So given the bad post this horse is going to get, even if he gets in, I would not want to emphasize him too strongly in this race, even if he does draw into the main body of the field. No, I won't use him at all. I, I totally agree with you. He seems to be have lost a few steps as a seven-year-old. He is being entered back in for a tag, albeit a slightly higher tag than what he was claimed for, but a tag nonetheless. So uh, obviously he would have to be in this field because it's a non-winners of one other than, but it's just not the most uh, ambitious spot, I don't think, or maybe ambitious isn't the best word. Not the most uh, optimistic spot, I don't think, if they really thought he was the same horse off the claim that he had been much late earlier in his career. Let's move on to the second leg of this pick five sequence, race eight, as we get into the graded stakes action. This is the Santa Anita Sprint Championship, grade two, prep for the Breeders' Cup Sprint, going six furlongs. And Craig, we've got a pretty evenly matched field signed on. Not that much pace in here. The number two vertical threat is shown as the clear leader on the Time Form US pace projector with a situation, uh, the blue flag favoring horses on or near the lead. What do you make of Vertical Threat? I, I, I know that he looks good on the Time Form US data. I'm a little bit skeptical of this horse's quality. I actually really like Vertical Threat in here. Uh, he, he is clearly going to be on the lead, in my opinion. And although his best races have come when shipped out of town, he won a big stakes race, big purse stakes race at Mahoning Valley with a nice figure to close out his three-year-old year. Obviously shipped to Charlestown for their classic night, won another one. And in, mixed in there is his try in the Bing Crosby at Del Mar, where he just has a terrible looking running line behind some of the same horses in here. But personally, I think that was just an absolutely brutal trip for a speed horse. He was drawn inside that day. He broke okay, but there was some really fast horses in there. Brickyard Ride was one of the horses, one of the fastest horses in California. And uh, he got pinned down inside uh, in a very uncomfortable position. It was his first start uh, off a very long layoff. I think it was about an eight or nine month layoff. So for me, I'm willing to put a line through that race in. I just don't really care that much for these California sprinters. I, I, I'm come right out and say Dr. Shivo is the morning line favorite. If he wins, I lose because I just have never been a big fan of this guy. He's never run particularly fast. He, he keeps winning, but I think he got a dream set up in that Crosby. I think some of the other horses are, are better than him from that field, including, including CZ Rocket. But I'm definitely going to use Vertical Thread. I'm going to use CZ Rocket, uh, maybe even a little Collusion Illusion. Uh, but I'm going to leave out Dr. Shivo and, and see where that gets me what, what do you think about this one yeah i'm taking the opposite view of vertical threat maybe i'm making a mistake here because he does look like he's going to get the right trip for him based on the pace projector and uh he's been dangerous when he's gotten the lead to himself in the past i just feel like those two big speed figures i really question the validity of them that race at mahoning valley it just feels like it happened in a different universe than what he's going to face at santa anita on saturday and last time out in that race at charlestown the russell road we've talked about this a little bit i really think there was a huge rail bias at charlestown last time and this horse was on the inside throughout we saw that race just dominated by horses that were inside uh or up on the pace wind of change chase chase this horse the entire way it was just like a merry-go-round despite the fact that the pace was fast so I don't totally buy that number and I'm not going to give him credit for setting the fast pace because that night we saw race after race with horses setting fast pace and not stopping so uh I'm going to downgrade vertical threat here he, he's not for me if he wins I'm going to lose uh I'm not totally against Dr. Shival. I'm not going to say that I love him as the favorite in this race because like you said he's not running that fast but he is just a three-year-old he still has upside I thought he ran fine to win the Bing Crosby last time. Frankly, I'd rather take him out of that race than CZ Rocket, who just seems to have lost his early speed for Peter Miller. And I thought CZ Rocket had every chance to win that Bing Crosby and Dr. Shival simply ran a better race. So I like Dr. Shival more than that horse. Uh, I find myself struggling to even get these words out, but I kind of think Flagstaff is the horse to beat in this race. You know that I've never liked this horse, nor have you, Craig, but I just feel like he's faced 
better company recently. He was chasing Ginobili last time, even Firenze Fire, who he faced two back in the true north. I would certainly like him in this race. Uh, Flagstaff just seems like he's pretty consistent. He's going to get the right trip, stalking the pace. And if I'm right about vertical threat not being of this quality, Flagstaff seems like the one that's going to take over first. And maybe he just gets the jump on them. Yeah, I mean, I can see that side of it. CZ Rocket did beat him pretty easily. Well, not easily, but he did beat him last time in that race against Ginobili. They had pretty similar trips, I would say. Uh, obviously, Flagstaff was just a little ahead, but I just can't can't get past the part that I, I've just never been a fan, and, and I have trouble latching on the horses like that. Maybe it'll bite me here, but usually it, it winds up serving me pretty well. I do want to mention Dr. Scheivel. As you said, he is a three-year-old, so he's a horse that I guess he could improve, but I've just never really seen it. He's basically running the same figures he did as a two-year-old, uh, just a few points above that. So I would have liked to see some more improvement from him. And more importantly is he's, you know, he's shown versatile, but he tends to run from off the pace. And I just don't see a whole lot of it in here. So I think we're going to differ on this one. I did mention Collusion Illusion a little bit. Uh, he's a horse who has a speed figure in the Malibu, a 119, when he ran behind two very good horses in Charlotte and, Ex and Express Train, who we'll talk about later, that would look really nice in this field. I have no idea why they put him on turf last time. He didn't run at all on that surface, but I'm willing to give him a, a little uh, break. And I'd just rather have a new face than, than lean on some of these California sprinters that I've just never been impressed with. No, I'm glad you mentioned Collusion Illusion because I was going to bring him up as well. He's another horse that I want to use in this race. Uh, like you said, the Malibu performance puts him right there. Don't know what to make of that turf sprint prep last time, but it probably was just that, a prep race. Uh, now he's landing in the right spot, and he's run some faster races than the other Mark Glatt trainee, Dr. Scheivel. And, you know, I would probably want slightly more than that four to one price, but I think we could get it on him if some others take a bit more money. Uh, so uh, I would I would use him as well in my wager. Move on to some grade one action in the Rodeo Drive, which is up next, going a mile and a quarter on the turf course for the Phillies and Mares. And we, we talk about it a lot, Craig. This Philly and Mare turf division out in California is just not the strongest. And we've got a couple horses that are likely to take money in this race from the Richard Baltus barn going to Vegas. Obviously makes sense. She's in great form right now. I don't think she'd have a prayer against a lot of the best horses on the East Coast, but they're not in this race. So I think she has to be taken seriously. And the other Richard Baltus trainee, Luck, seems like a new face that probably is going to take some money in here, too. Yeah, I think that I'm going to use three horses in here, and, and you've already mentioned two of them, and I won't uh, harp too long on going to Vegas because you pretty much covered it. She comes in with the best last race speed figure. She's in top form. Uh, the pace projector shows her on a very clear early lead, which is always an advantage in my opinion, and when you actually take a closer look at the pace projector, the horse shown in second is Dog Tag, a horse that is far from a speed horse, so I just don't see any way she doesn't have an easy lead in here. Uh, so I don't particularly love her. I don't think she's a lock. I'm certainly not going to single her, but there's no way I'm not going to use her in here. But the horse I do like a little bit more than her is that horse you mentioned, Luck. Uh, she shipped in uh, from France, won first time out for Richard Baltus. It, it was no big surprise that day. She was 8-5 to five, uh, in that allowance field. And though she only ran a 110, and I, I kind of use only in air quotes uh, because it's not that far off most of the horses in here, I think there was plenty more in the tank that day. Uh, the pace was pretty slow early, moderate in the middle, and she just simply engulfed that field af after being pretty far back early. So she's going to wind up being my A horse in here, even though she doesn't quite have that speed figure uh, that going to Vegas has shown. But I really think there is more in the tank, as I mentioned earlier. So uh, I'll save my other one for later. But those are the, are the two that I'm really going to lean on. Yeah, of those two horses, I much prefer going to Vegas for a lot of the reasons that you said. She just figures to get a perfect trip in this race. I don't think that going to Vegas is necessarily a grade one type horse, and I doubt she ever wins a grade one race again. But uh, 
this just seems like it's really served up to her on a silver platter. I mean, if she doesn't win it this time, I don't think she's ever going to because she's just going to be loose up front and she can get the mile and a quarter distance. She's got a nice sprint finish to her when people don't, uh, when the other riders don't press her early. And it doesn't seem like that's going to happen here. So I just think going to Vegas makes a lot of sense. When I handicapped this race, I wanted to be against her and I just couldn't quite get there. I do strongly prefer her to the other horse that you mentioned, Luck. Uh, it feels to me like Luck is going to take a lot of money in this race and she's got quite a bit to prove from a class standpoint she really wasn't facing much in europe uh the one time she met a good horse over there was in her final race in france the uh pre uh bedel finishing behind irazine who actually is a good horse uh, that one is seven for ten in his career and uh recently finished third in the pre foie the prep for the arc uh but she was no factor in that race finishing last and her one u.s start she was 8-5 to five for a reason. If you look up that field, there just wasn't a whole lot of quality in there. The runner-up came back to win, but just did so with a, a mediocre performance at an allowance level. And she was visually impressive that day, but she reminds me a little bit of that Chad Brown trainee pocket square from earlier in the year who people were raving about when she beat a bad field at Keeneland in her U.S. debut. And she was favored in the Just a Game, a grade one off that, uh, despite the fact that she had really beaten nothing in her first start stateside. And she turned out to be a little bit of a disappointment. I know that she won a stakes last weekend, but she just wasn't grade one quality at that period of time. And I think luck, it's going to be a similar situation where she takes a lot of money. And I think others have run a little bit better up until this point. She has to improve and she might do it. I just don't want to take her as maybe vying for favoritism uh, with so much ground to make up on some others in here. And the horse that I'm most interested in to use as the alternative to going to Vegas is the number seven Magic Attitude, who I imagine is the other horse that you're talking about too, Craig. Uh, she's the one East Coast shipper in this race. And while I don't love her recent form, not really being a factor in races like the, the Diana and the New York, both of those races were run over ground with a little bit of give to them, and I really think Magic Attitude is better over firm turf courses, which she got when she won the Belmont Oaks. She also got when she won the Sheep's Head Bay earlier in the year, and she's going to get a firm turf course on Saturday at Santa Anita. So I'm worried about the pace for her because there's not much of it at all outside of going to Vegas, but I do think she's good enough to be a major player in this race. Yeah, she was the third horse I wanted to mention, and specifically for the reason you said. She's kind of the the new face against a group that we don't think is all that strong. So just the, the sheer drop in class, even though they're both listed as grade ones, I, I don't think anybody would consider this grade one equal to the grade one Diana or even the grade two New York, for that matter. I mean, Mean Mary would probably be two to five in a field like this if she was in here, and uh, she's not. So yeah, Magic Attitude is definitely the other horse for me. Let's move on to the grade one awesome again, going a mile and an eighth on the main track. This is really the feature race on Saturday at Santa Anita, the penultimate leg of this pick five sequence. And we're going to see something that we don't really get that often these days before the Breeders' Cup, a three-year-old taking on older horses. Seems like a lot of these three-year-olds these days, they prep for the Breeders' Cup either in the Travers or the Pennsylvania Derby, trying to duck the spots where they have to face older runners. Um, we're certainly not seeing three-year-olds as major contenders in either the Woodward or the Lucas Classic, just Medina Spirit taking on Olders in this race, the awesome again. And what do you make of his chances? I, obviously, this is a horse that's very polarizing, some triggering uh, thoughts about this horse many people have. Um, but at the end of the day, Medina Spirit's pretty good. Yeah, I mean, he's been a model of consistency. Now, how he achieved that, you can say what you want about that. But as a better, he's in the field. I'm looking at the PPs, and he consistently runs in the low 120s. And, and as a three-year-old who I think the last race was pretty much a prep race, I, I don't think it would be crazy to think he's going to run a better race this time and maybe hit those one uh, mid-120s. And that's particularly true when you look at the pace projector because he has shown out front all by himself, kind of like we talked about with going to Vegas and when you look in behind the the horse who's likely to be chasing him is Stiletto Bay a horse who's 20 to 1 on the morning line um Outside of that, uh, where's the challenge going to come from? It's hard to see. So I personally think it would be foolish not to use Medina Spirit uh, as, as a main player in this race. 
Yeah, I mean, just to kind of preview things, I'm going to try to get much thinner in these last two legs of the sequence, and Medina Spirit would be a horse that I lean on here. Uh, I agree with everything you said about the way this race is going to shape up. He just seems like he's going to control things on the front end. I mean, like you said, horses like Stiletto Boy have a bit of tactical speed. Ex Express Train has a little bit too, but they're not really fast enough to push Medina Spirit when he runs the kind of enterprising race that he did in the Kentucky Derby or even the Preakness, and... Last time out, I was impressed with that victory in the shared belief. I know that he wasn't facing the likes of this field and rock your world. I, I, you could have mixed feelings about his ability at this point in time because he hasn't shown up in some big spots. But I liked the way Medina Spirit did that. He had his ears pricked through the stretch, never looked like he was all out to win that race, earned a nice speed figure. And he's supposed to be better stretching out to the mile and an eighth distance as opposed to a mile. More distance is supposed to help this horse. So, I mean, say what you will about his Kentucky Derby and what was going on with him early in the year. I think it's all speculation. Nobody really knows. But this horse has put out the performances that he has on the racetrack. And if he matures the way that you would expect him to, like all other three-year-olds do, I think that he's going to be pretty tough to beat in here. So he could be the favorite, but I think he should be. And he's one that I want to lean on. The only other horse that I would want to use prominently is Express Train. Uh, we've talked about this horse quite a bit, Craig. I don't think a mile and a quarter is really for him. Turning back to the mile and eighth is going to be better. And last time out, he just got the wrong trip. I don't know how he was so far back in the early going of that Pacific Classic. Yeah, I'm not really sure what to make of him. I'm a little more against him than you are in this spot. And yeah, I watched the replay. The trip wasn't great. He did get to shuffle back a little bit as he was in tight early in the race and kind of lost some position. But my one concern about him is he has had just a long campaign. He's been running about 15 months straight. He's run a lot of races. And he just kind of looked like a tired horse to me last time. Maybe it was the trip, but in a race where I want to start paring it down and go shorter, as you said, I don't particularly care for express training here. Uh, another one I don't want to use at all is Idol, the winner of the San Anita Handicap. Uh, he's a horse we talked about many times. I think we actually both liked him that day. But we bo also both agreed he was more of a mile and a quarter type horse. I, I don't think this mile and an eighth is going to do him any favors. And I have to think this is just a prep race for him. I, I can't imagine he would be all out. I imagine the goal is the Breeders' Cup Classic next month. So I want no parts of him. For the horse I'm going to use second is Tripoli, the horse who won that Pacific Classic last time. And I just think since switching to her, uh, Dirt, he's a horse who's been in really good form. His speed figures keep improving a little bit. So while that was a little bit of a, a fluky race, I, I don't think it was totally a fluke for him as he's a horse who just seems to be getting better, seems to like Dirt. So I don't want to totally dismiss him. So for me, it's going to be Medina Spirit and Tripoli. Yeah, I don't think Tripoli is impossible. I, I think it'd be foolish to discount a horse in the kind of form that he is in. I thought he got a great trip at the Pacific Classic in a race where some others were a little out of position early, and he was able to take the position they should have been in. Uh, he's really previously been more of a closing type, uh, but I, he's just doing so well right now. I think it would be foolish to throw him out here. So I'll use him as a backup, but I really do want to lean more on Medina Spirit in this race and use Express Train as the primary backup with maybe Tripoli as more of a C type. Yeah, and if there was one horse I was going to use as a C-type in here, it would be the two mid-court. Uh, he's a horse who is just really erratic. You never know what you're going to get from him, but his good races are good enough to win this race, including beat a horse like Medina Spirit. He's run races where he's been right up on the lead. His best races have actually come there. He came off a layoff, won an allowance race at San Anita with a, a good 121 speed figure. He's been unsighted since, but... Maybe this race was the plan all along because when you pull up his workouts, he worked about two weeks later and he's pretty much been working like clockwork ever since. He had a brief uh, uh, spell where he missed a couple weeks uh, back in September, but otherwise, I mean, it seems like this has been the goal all along. So at, at a horse that's going to be a long price, he's one I would use as my seat. Yeah, I'm glad you brought him up because you make a good point about him running races in the past that put him in the mix here. I'm a little worried about the inside post position because he's a horse that tends to not break that alertly, and that's why he doesn't always get that forward trip that he really wants to get. So I would prefer him with an outside post, but he's going to be a price in this race, so I'm not going to try to talk you off him as a backup in here.
And the one other horse I wanted to mention, because I really didn't know what to do with him, ultimately I decided not to use him, and that's the one Tis a Magician. I only bring him up because he, he is 4-1 to one on the morning line, a, a co-third choice, and, and a horse that many probably feel has a big shot in here, but I just couldn't get myself to land on him. For one, it just it's... I don't see him beating Tripoli. That one was just a better horse that day. Uh, and that one just seems like a little bit more of a fluke uh, to me. What did you think about Tis a Magician? Yeah, I agree. I don't see him getting the lead in this race from Medina Spirit. And he strikes me as more of just a galloping mile and a quarter, mile and a half type type horse. I think the turn all the way back to a mile and an eighth is going to expose him a little bit. So he wasn't for me either. Let's move on to the final leg of this pick five sequence, wrapping up the graded stakes action at Santa Anita. It's the John Henry Turf Cup, Turf Championship, going a mile and a quarter on the turf. And it's a large field, Craig, but there is quite a bit of filler in this race. And you do have to start the conversation with the longtime leader of this California turf division, United. If he gets back to his better efforts, he's going to beat this field. Yeah, it's funny you use the word filler because that's exactly the word I used in my notes. I said this is a weak field for a grade two with a lot of filler. There's just a lot of horses in here that are too slow or have big distance questions and that I won't consider at all. And given the other races we've talked about where, you know, there's been some spreading and, and no real races, no singles that I've been able to come up with. This is another race where I'm going to go pretty short. I'm only going to use two horses. And the one of those is the horse that I think is a legit grade two horse, has the figures, the distance isn't a concern, and that's United. I mean, you can easily watch the replay from his last race. See, he definitely had a bit of a trip in there. He usually is a horse that's able to work out good trips, but it just didn't work out that day. It should be a little easier at a mile and a quarter. Speed fields tend to spread out a little more. So I think United is a horse that definitely should be leaned on pretty heavily in here. Yeah, there were two horses that had a real trouble in that Del Mar handicap. One of them was United, who was just buried in traffic coming to the top of the stretch. You could see about 5 16th from the mi from a mile from the wire that uh, Flavian Pratt was going to have a real difficult time getting him into the clear, and he just wasn't able to do it until it was too late. And the other horse that had real trouble in there was Say the Word, who was not entered back in this race, and I would have loved Save the Word if he was running here, but he's probably running somewhere else, or maybe he's sidelined. I haven't seen reporting on that. Um, so United's the one who had the trouble coming out of that race and I think he probably would have won or been a close second to say the word in that Delmar handicap if they had gotten clear runs and that performance probably be good enough to beat this field because as you were saying most of the other horses are just a little bit too slow they got better trips if they finished ahead of United last time horses like Masterpiece and Acclimate I, I don't want them in this spot especially not Acclimate but so much other speed signed on and United, a mile and a quarter is his distance. He has a versatile running style where he can come from off the pace or be closer. And I just think he makes way too much sense in here. So uh, he would be my A in this race and the others would be distant backups for me. Yeah, the only other horse I'm going to use at all in here is the 10 horse Red King. He's a horse who has some back races that could win this. He's a horse who has... Didn't come out with the best form this year, but he's slowly been improving his speed figures. He didn't have a trip anything like United did last time, but it was a bit of an adventurous ride, and he did have some trouble in the stretch. So he's one, I think, at a price that I'm going to use on my ticket. But that will be about it for me. I can't see me latching on to anybody else in here. Just not a fan. Yeah, we're on pretty much the same page about that. Uh, you know, Red King, I would use him as a distant backup, but unlike United, who was racing in the bridle, ready to go whenever Flavian Pratt found to see him, uh, Red King was already being ridden into the race at the time that he found that trouble. So I don't think it was quite as consequential for him. And his prior races, they, they don't, they don't really make me want to bet him in here, uh, but uh, he is one that I could use as a backup. And the other horse that I would use as a distant backup is the number 12 Friars Road coming off an optional claiming win. It hasn't shown the class necessary to win a race like this, but so many of these, I feel like we've already seen the best of them. They're either on the downswing or we their form is plateaued and we know what they are and we know they're not good enough to beat United. At least Friars Road is one with a little bit of upside who's going to be a big price and we don't really know how good he's going to ultimately be on the turf. So he's one that I would use just uh, on the chance that he might be on the upswing. 
the the one thing I was excited about for this race, it's something I don't often get a chance to do. It happens once in a while at Belmont, is I'm actually going to have two mile and a quarter turf races on the same course with which to make speed figures for. So aside from the betting aspect, that is something that was very exciting to me because it, it's something that happens like once every other leap year. Hopefully they actually have legitimate paces. I'm not sure that we're going to get uh, a particularly fast pace in the Rodeo Drive. And it seems like this uh, John Henry has a much faster pace likely to come. So I hope you can group them together, Craig. But they, the paces might be so different that you can't. So, so we'll see how that actually works out. Don't be ringing in on my parade, David. We'll talk <laughs> about that later. <laughs> uh, so just to wrap things up, I want to talk a little bit about ticket construction because I did put together a ticket for this in DRF uh, Ticket Maker. And uh, it's one that I want to tinker with a little bit to see how much money I really want to invest in this. Uh, the ticket that I currently have in the system that I'm looking at is about $53. I could beef it up a little bit using some other horses or elevating some Cs to Bs. We'll talk about that maybe as I go through it. Uh, in the first leg, I want to use a bunch of A's in this race, four of them to be specific. The one Lincoln Hawk, the four Memo Daddy, the five One Fast Bro, and the nine Burn and Turf. Really, my wager is structured around this race. I want to be right about one of those four horses playing against the ones that I think could be favored, like first Premio if he gets in and the number 10 Secret Club. They're not on my tickets anywhere. Uh, so if I'm right about one of those four, I can advance in this sequence in the eighth race, that sprint. Uh, I'm going to lean a little bit on Flagstaff, but I want to use as prominent backups, both Mark Glatt runners, the one Dr. Shival and the six Collusion Illusion. Uh, they would all be A's and B's for me. And really the others, I don't need them that much. Uh, CZ Rocket, I'm against him. And I'm also going to let that speed horse beat me who Craig likes. Uh, race nine, I'm going to lean on Magic Attitude and going to Vegas. Uh, the others like Luck would be a distant backup if I use them at all. But uh, going to Vegas and Magic Attitude are the horses that I want most of the play to go through. Similarly, in the Awesome Again, I want most of my play to go through Medina Spirit with Express Train as the primary backup and then a distant backup being Tripoli. And then the last leg, like I said, United, the only A, the others would be C's for me if I use backups, and those would be horses like Masterpiece, Red King, and that uh, horse Friars Road was coming off that impressive victory. Now, for me, I, I did not get to make a ticket in Ticket Maker because I couldn't figure it out for Parks last week, but I am going to do it for Santa Anita. That is a promise. I will put one out. Uh, but I, I can say we pretty much agree in the seventh race. I, I don't think we there was a single horse we didn't agree on. Definitely on the sprint, uh, I will be doing it a bit differently. I'm going to lean on vertical threat and collusion, or not collusion, CZ Rocket. And then just a backup in collusion illusion. The uh, Rodeo Drive, I I'm going to lean on going to Vegas and luck and, and use a little bit of magic attitude. And in my notes, a horse I forgot to mention, I don't want to get too far into it, but maybe a distant like C- minus fast jet court for Michael McCarthy. Just a horse who's only run once in this country and is stretching out. Sorry I missed that one going through. The awesome again, we agree on Medina Spirit. I, I think he's a must use. I, I'm going to use Tripoli as more as a B and midcourt as a C. And then the John Henry we talked about. For me, it's just going to be heavily on United with um, Red King more as a C type horse. Well, that's how we're playing this pick five sequence on Saturday at Santa Tina. Good luck if you're playing, and hopefully we give out some good ideas that can help you hit it, because it seems like a sequence that could play pretty well. Uh, I don't think this is one that's going to be dominated by favorites. At least I hope not, because those first couple legs look pretty competitive. So we'll see how it all shakes out, and we'll recap these races when we come back to the Time Form US Pace Cast on Tuesday. A lot of Breeders' Cup preps this weekend, so we'll talk about their implications on those races in early November. Remember that you can always listen to us on DRF. Com, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Just make sure to subscribe to the Daily Racing Form channel. Thanks for tuning in this week, and make sure to catch that Time Form US Pacecast next Tuesday.